welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we take you on a spiritual journey to one of India's most underrated states when it comes to travel and tourism. We talk to Prasanjit Sharma as he takes us on a journey to the capital of Tantric worship in India. Let's hop onto the episode and find out more. So with that introduction, we'd love to welcome Prasanjit Sharma, the founder of Kama Kya Walks and Six Degree Adventures to the Musafar Stories. Prasanjit, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast and welcome. Hi, Saif. Uh, it's a pleasure being on your podcast. Uh, actually, it's really nice that we can talk about a uh, part of the country uh, that has not been covered. Uh, and I look forward to talking about a subject that is very close to my heart, which is uh, Kamekha, spiritual tourism in Assam. Wonderful. No, thank you so much, Prasanjit. It's really glad to have you and really excited, uh, like I said, to be covering a part of the country that um, unfortunately we haven't had a chance to cover so far in the five, five and a half years of Musafra story. So really, really excited and looking forward to this. The introduction I gave about you was also very short and concise, Prasanjit. So why don't you speak a little bit about, more about yourself and uh, what you do? Basically, I'm uh, born and brought up in Assam. Uh, but then I've had the privilege of studying and working in all four corners of the country. From quite early in my life, after my first job, I realized that the normal nine to five uh, suit and tie job was not for me. So I met some people and I took them around Calcutta. That's where I was living at that point. And I felt that tourism was a good fit for my interest. So then I pursued my master's in tourism and later on uh, worked for some of the best travel companies in India. And after gaining the experience that I wanted, I started uh, Six Degree Adventures uh, in 2017 and later started Kameka Walks early this year in 2022. Kameka Walks was kind of a result of what I felt was needed in uh, in the city like Guwahati because Guwahati was being used more like a transit point for people traveling to other parts of Northeast. Heritage walks in the city had a lot of scope because I have worked for a heritage walking tour company in Calcutta. The place I selected was Kamekha because of the depth and the vastness of the experiences that can be given to travelers. So that's basically how I came to start two companies. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, I completely agree that um, a place like Guwahati, uh, it is high time that we start looking at it beyond uh, like just a transit point, like you mentioned, right? There's so much, so much more. And uh, I have to admit as well, I had also been very ignorant about a lot of the things the city has to offer. And as a part of uh, researching for this episode, when my eyes were kind of opened up to a lot of uh, different places and very diverse places too, right? Uh, uh, usually we tend to uh, tie Assam just to like Kaziranga, right? Like the nature part of it. But even from a spirituality, religion part of it as well, there's so much more to offer. And even beyond that too, to be honest. So really looking forward to this um, session, to this recording with you. Prasanjit, now just to uh, set some context up for our listeners, can you also please give us a little bit of a geographical context as to what part of India we are talking about, where exactly this is located, and also what is a good way to get here? Yeah, sure. So, Assam is known as the gateway to the Seven Sisters. So, the northeastern states, which are basically seven states, and then you include Sikkim, it makes eight states, uh, which is considered the northeast. And Assam, uh, the capital of Assam being Guwahati, known as Dispur as well, has the best connectivity in terms of uh, airways and uh, railways. This is basically in the north, you have states like Arunachal, uh, Nagaland, Mizoram, Tripura, and so on. And if you talk about international borders, we have, (laughs) we share borders with uh, China, Burma, uh, and Bangladesh. 
the closest international airport is Calcutta. Uh, actually, there are other international airports, but it has got the best connections. Yeah, uh, very well connected by uh, railways and roadways as well. Like you mentioned, it's the almost like a gateway to a lot of the other northeastern states as well that are not connected through railways. So very well connected. Um, so getting here should definitely not be a problem. In terms of visiting here, what time of the year would you suggest or recommend um, would be a good time to visit? So if you talk about north of Assam, you have Arunachal, which is basically the lower Himalayas. So to visit mm -hmm. the lower Himalayas, the best time to visit is summers. So that is uh, from March to October. And for people who want to see snow and snow-capped mountains, then winters is also a good thing. But for considering about the uh, other parts of uh, Northeast, which is Nagaland, uh, Assam and so on. So it follows the normal tourist season like the rest of India, which is October to March. And this is the time where all the national parks are also open. So we have two UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Uh, which is Manas National Park and Kaziranga. And generally this opens uh, in October and closes in March. So when you're traveling, you want to see these things. So that is the best time to travel. Yeah, definitely. If you're planning a broader itinerary beyond just Guwahati, then uh, a lot of these things that Prasenjit called out do definitely make sense. So you can plan your trip and your itinerary accordingly. Um, uh, just jumping into the meet of the conversation for today, right? We wanted to cover off uh, one of your primary uh, trout puller walks does cover the Kamakya temple complex, um, right? The very, very iconic and famous religious and spiritual center in the Northeast, the Kamakya temple complex. Uh, do you want to set some background about the place and its origin itself? Uh, why the Kamakya temple is so popular and uh, even in terms of the uh, religious background um, or who is the deity prayed to in this at this temple uh, and details like that Prasenjit? Sure so uh, Kamekha walks is basically uh, we cover Nilachal hill so Nilachal hill is located you can say on the outskirts of Guwahati this place has had a huge significance for Hinduism so Kamekha is known as one of the main Shakti Peets. So generally people think that there are 51 Shakti Peets, but when Shakti Peets were actually given that name, there were only four Shakti Peets. Uh, that was uh, two in Orissa, one in Calcutta, and one in Assam. So the Kameka uh, temple is where the Yoni, the reproductive part of Goddess Parvati, is believed to have fallen. Those who are not familiar with uh, the origin story as such, so Lord Shiva, who is the destroyer and also uh, the uh, known as the Mahade, the god of gods, mm -hmm. his uh, wife was Sati. Sati's father is Daksha. And Lord Shiva is not like the ideal son-in-law for anyone. So he is covered in, uh, you know, he covers himself with ash. He wears a tiger skin around his waist and he has a ghost and a serpent around his neck. So yeah. he is, by any standard, not the ideal son-in-law. And uh, Daksha, the king, uh, the father of Sati, uh, held this huge yagna, like a ritual. And uh, to insult Shiva, he did not invite Shiva for this thing. And all the other lesser demigods were invited. So Sati... Even though uh, Lord Shiva told Sati not to go for this yagna, she still went. And when she saw that other people were making fun of her husband, the great Mahadev, she got very upset and jumped onto this uh, ceremonial fire and uh, she basically died. So Lord Shiva, being the god of destruction, got very upset and started doing the dance of destruction, which is known as Tandav. And it is said that while he was doing this Tandav, the earth tilted on its axis. So uh, the other gods like Vishnu and Brahma got very scared that if he continues dancing with Sati's body on his shoulder, the universe or the Brahman cosmos would be destroyed. So what they did is uh, Vishnu basically sent his uh, weapon, which is known as Sudarshan Chakra, and cut uh, Sati's body into 51 pieces and while Shiva was dancing these 51 pieces fell across 
uh, India and other parts of the world as well. So uh, it is believed that uh, the yoni, the reproductive part, fell in Kamekha. So Kamekha is known for tantric fertility worship. Now coming to Tantra, when you say Tantra or Tantric, it, it gives a negative connotation. Uh, we will get into that later in this talk, but uh, Tantra is just another way of worshipping. So let's say uh, climbing the Mount Everest, you can climb by the north face or the south face. So it's a similar way. You have different ways to reach whatever spiritual goal uh, that, that exists, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about Tantra, there are two types of Tantra. One is called Shaiv Tantra uh, and one is called Shakti Tantra. So Shaiv Tantra is believed to have originated in Kashmir. And Kamekha mm -hmm. is the origin of Shakti Tantra. Okay. People who go to Nilachal Hill, uh, who go to Kamekha, the reason why we started Kamekha Walks is that when you go there, there on average, there are 5,000 pilgrims who go to Kamekha on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And they are only concerned about visiting the Sanctum Sanctorium of the main temple. And in the Sanctum Sanctorium, you basically go down like a cave and there is a body of water and then you touch that water and that is how you pay your respects to the goddess. What, and in this Sanctum Sanctorium, there are three goddesses present. Uh, basically, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Parvati. But here the names are Tripura, Sundari, Kamala and Matangi. What the pilgrims do not realize is that there are ten other god means In total, there are ten goddesses in, the, in this Nilachal hill. And they are known as the Das Mahavidyas. So Das Mahavidya is, basically means ten great wisdom or ten great sources of knowledge. So right. what we try to do in this walk is that we try to take people who come on this walk to the different other temples which are overlooked by most uh, pilgrims. And then we try and show them uh, sculptures and we talk about the architecture and also the people who call Nilachal um, home have very important parts to play in the temple. And we want to actually, in our own way, put some positive uh, uh, light uh, on tantric worship. So when you talk about tantric worship, people generally think black magic and voodoo and all of that. But this is something right. very different. So that is what we're trying mm. to do. Now, very, very interesting. And thanks so much for uh, such a detailed back rub. Uh, just in terms of the duration of the walks, uh, usually how long are these walks for? So our basic walk lasts for about uh, between two to three hours. So we start okay. Uh, from the main temple complex and we end in the multi-level parking lot. Okay. We are going to cover the entire Nilachal hill. So, talking about mythology, there's another story which talks mm -hmm. about this demon called Narsasur. So, mm -hmm. Narsasur wanted to marry Goddess Kamekha. So, Goddess Kamekha set him a challenge. So, the challenge was to build three staircases uh, from sunset to sunrise before the cock crows. Okay. Mm -hmm. This demon is very powerful and he uh, was able to complete two staircases and was almost about to complete the third staircase. And this is when the goddess realized she did not want to marry the demon. So she took the form of a cock, I'm like a cockerel, uh, a hen. Mm -hmm. And then she, uh, before the sun rose, she actually started cuckooing or whatever the word is. Yeah. So... Yeah. So the demon basically lost the challenge and was not able to marry uh, the goddess. So these are the yeah, three staircases. Uh, they're called the Ujjala path. So they are the old, pil the old pilgrims. They used to walk up mm. to the temple. So the Kamekha temple is situated on the top of the hill. We are basically going to take people from the top of the hill to the bottom, showing them the old paths and the temples that are along the way. So that is a, going to be a full day kind of activity. Okay, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and just in terms of the known history, uh, is there a sense of um, like how many years old uh, the, the site might be? Yeah, so one of the premier institutions here, like universities here is uh, Cotton University. So some mm. of the archaeologists there have done some kind of carbon dating. So... Uh, they have been able to trace it back something like 2,200 years uh, back. Mm. That is 
one of the figures that come up but then like general understanding of people is that it is built around the 18th century so the temple has been right. built and destroyed and rebuilt several times right so general people think it's around the 18th century but actually it goes back to something like 2200 years yeah yeah very interesting and uh, also do you want to uh, touch upon a little the architectural style of these temples that was also uh, quite unique right it yes. seems different from let's say a lot of the temples we see in south india or even those that we see in north india it's very unique from those and almost like a fusion you could say so do you want to touch upon that a little bit sure so uh, nilachal the temples around kamakha they have their mm-hmm. own style of architecture which is called the nilachala style of architecture so the nilachala style is basically a combination of nagara hindu temple architecture and indo saracenic mm-hmm. architecture so the nagara mm-hmm. architecture is what you see that is the general hindu temples and indo saracenic is the dome structures basically christian and islamic architecture put together so the temple some of the right. temples that you see is combination of hindu islamic and uh, christian architecture and it has got its own name which is nilachal style of architecture yeah yeah right now when you go to kamakha you will not get to see very many uh, evidences of tantric worship but through some friends who actually are some of the important families who have lived there for centuries they have helped us mm-hmm. develop the walk and they have guided us uh, with information and facts mm. yeah very interesting uh, because uh, yeah even i while looking this up there was uh, mentions about um again this it wasn't very clear like you mentioned uh there was contradictory information from place to place but uh there was this uh, notion about uh this place being used for animal sacrifice in the past and even now i don't think it's as much sacrifice but uh, you do find like goats and pigeons etc that are given away as offerings right um uh, 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 sacrifice have... is very much part of uh-huh. the worshiping uh, the goddesses and also mm-hmm. offering alcohol Mm. So, so what is controversial is human sacrifice so some people say that human sacrifice has had taken place which is a controversial i will not say that it ever took place or anything but there is some kind of mm. uh, folklore or myth about it but talking about like sacrifices and alcohol to get into the basics of it is that there are basically there are seven ways of worshiping any god okay so mm-hmm. the basic level is when you as a child or something your parents take you to a shiv temple a ganesh temple a durga temple etc like you go to a lot of different places right mm-hmm. so this is basically building the minimum connection to spiritual spirituality or the higher beings right let's just say that that you visit all the different temples and then you're getting more and more spiritual that is the beginning step 1 and there are seven mm-hmm. steps in this way of worshiping so after the fourth step you have to take something called as diksha so you will have to ex- accept a, a guru will have to accept you and you have to accept the guru he will set certain guidelines of how you are supposed to live your daily life what kind of practices you are supposed to do and the interesting thing is that from the fourth step tantrism starts and it goes up fourth mm-hmm. fifth and um, fourth to the seventh step mm-hmm. after the fourth step is where the controversy of tantrism exists so in tantricism you are supposed to at a certain point when you have gained some knowledge and uh, let's say uh, some discipline you can do something called as uh, the pancha makara offerings so in the pancha makara offerings you offer grain meat fish alcohol and the most controversial is sex so it is not like you go buy a tandoori chicken and give it to the goddess it is that you have to purify yourself you have to purify whatever you're offering and then for some thing you basically offer it to the goddess and this is where it becomes controversial so this is where it is called the left hand and the right hand practice so the right hand pra- mm-hmm. practice is called dakshina chari that is what you see all across india in most temples where it is basically chanting of uh, sanskrit hymns and you know uh offering certain flowers and so on whereas vamachari which is the tantric tantric practices is where you offer these five things which are controversial 
Mm. Yeah, and uh, if you ask anyone, what is the goal of your spiritual practice or going to a temple? They'll say that we want moksha or enlightenment. But mm -hmm. the goal of tantricism is not only to gain enlightenment, but it is to have so much energy and so much purity in your body that the goddess that you're worshipping, god or goddess that you're worshipping, enters you and then you become like a god. That is what is one of the objectives of tantricism. To be honest, I will also not be able to speak in depth about tantricism sure. because I will have to take diksha under a guru and I will be able to teach those things to someone who's taking diksha. So it is a secretive society in a way. So you cannot yeah, go no. talking about this in public, right in a way. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I do completely agree, but at least even getting to know that this is what it is about and uh, setting some background and context, it definitely does help um, clear up the understanding a little bit more, right? Uh, like I said, it's not the complete understanding yet because of the way it's structured in itself, but again, just gives you a better understanding. So thank you for kind of calling this out. And the other interesting thing I also saw is uh, the celebration of this festival called as Ambubachi, uh, right? Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, Isn't absolutely. You? So you may see a lot of uh, campaigns going around on social media, make periods normal and those kind of mm. things, you know, the new millennial generation. But as I told you, this temple dates back more than 2200 years. And the Ambubasi festival is basically celebrating the menstruation cycle of the goddess. So mm. this festival generally takes place around June or so. Mm -hmm. The, it is believed that the goddess is having a period and she takes a break so the temple is closed for a certain number of days as I told you generally about 5,000 people go to uh, Kamekha on a daily basis during the Ambubasi mm -hmm. Mela the last estimate was 500,000 people showed up for those three days and wow. okay. this has been termed as the mini kumb mm -hmm. and people want to be there when the after the three days uh, when the gates are open they want to be the first people to enter the temple and you should see the crowds it is just unbelievable and um, during this time traditional families of assam will not even worship in their normal you know altar at home so no kind of worship mm -hmm. takes place around assam during that time that is how significant it is so we have been worshiping something like that, like a, like menstruation cycle, which is considered very sacred uh, here for centuries. Yeah. A couple of interesting points I came across as well. Obviously, you mentioned that uh, it is widely known in the area, and you have like over 500,000 uh, people visiting the temple right after this period, right? The three, four day period yeah. Uh, yeah. when it's shut down. Uh, one of the uh, things that of interest was that. Uh, it is believed that even within the temple, right, like you mentioned, the Garbhagriha or the Sanctum Centrum, where the, there's a, technically speaking, there's no deity as such, right? It's basically a rock yes. uh, with a little bit of a crevice uh, out of which there's water coming out. And uh, it is believed that even that turns red during that period. I read a couple of accounts of this when I was re doing the research, but I'm not entirely sure. So I wanted to touch, uh, check this with you as well, if there's something you come across. And also read about... Uh, the river Brahmaputra, right? The river in the vicinity, that also turning red around this time. Uh, uh, have you come across any of uh, this information? Uh, I'll it? talk mm -hmm. about the first part. Uh, it is like even the main head priests are not allowed to enter the temple at that time. What happens mm -hmm. after the temple opens is the, there's this red cloth that is, uh, if you can get the red cloth that is soaked in that water uh, when the mm -hmm. temple opens, it is considered like the best blessing that you can get. Mm. Uh, so I will not be able to tell you whether uh, the temp, like the water in the temple turns red, but that is a belief mm -hmm. among a lot of people. But I cannot verify that. What happens is you give a red cloth and it is soaked into that water and it's given back to you and that you keep it in your house as a blessing. Mm -hmm. And coming to the second part uh, about the Brahmaputra turning red, that is the time when we have our annual floods. So a lot of erosion mm -hmm. takes place and you can say the Brahmaputra turns muddy, which may be considered turning red by some people. So. Okay. <laughs> and it does uh, take yeah. a lot of lives, so uh, during the floods. So I guess that is the old 
Yeah, no, no. Uh, cool, no, thank you for uh, clarifying that bit for us as well. Um, and just in general speaking about the Kamakya temple and the complex, uh, within your work as well, when you're doing the walks and uh, visiting these 10 different temples, um, any uh, unique experiences or interactions that you would like to highlight for us, uh, be it uh, just in terms of the other temples like the Das Mahavidyas that you mentioned, or uh, even interaction with, let's say, the communities that are there, uh, right from the Pandas to any of the other communities within the temple? Now that's a very nice question. So, when you talk about the communities and the people, it is like an ecosystem that was set up for the maintenance and the upkeep of the temple. So the old kings of the Ahom and the Koch dynasties uh, settled people there who were needed, like, you know, uh, who would clean the temple, who would provide security, who would do, who would perform different functions that are required to maintain the temple. Uh, when we talk about, uh, when you talk about Hinduism, the caste system was one of the most common questions I had uh, from some of the international guests. And yeah. when you explain the caste system, you say that the cleaners, you know, are generally the lowest uh, strata of society. Mm -hmm. But here, what is interesting is that uh, the cleaners of the temple are called the Mali community. The Mali community okay. is the first, every day, they're the first people to enter the Sanctum Sanctorium. When they are there, uh, no one is allowed to enter and they are the ones who remove the old flowers who give the first bath to the goddess is done by the Mali community and even the head priests are not allowed to enter this temple so if you actually talk about that that they actually are even ahead of the priest in some way you know so mm. the whole thing if you look at it that way it's like the concept of the caste system changes when you see that Another interesting community, which a lot of people may not know, and it is actually disappearing, uh, is the mm -hmm. Gayan Bayan community. Mm -hmm. The Gayan Bayan community, when you talk of people, when you just mention the name, they will consider uh, Vaishnavites. So, in mm -hmm. Assam, we had a spiritual leader known as Srimanta Shankardev. He started a Vaishnavite sect, and in that, uh, they used to sing the praises of Lord Krishna and uh, uh, there was one group who would play the drums and one group that would play the cymbals yeah so these uh, this community is known as Gayan Bayan now when you talk about Gayan Bayan everybody considers it in places like Majuli or uh, for sure. Krishna worship but there is a Gayan Bayan community for Shakti worship in Kamekha which hardly anybody knows and the sad part is one of like the, the huge treasure trove of information uh, passed away last year and his son does a normal nine to five job in the government so he does not have the information that we actually want so these are the traditions that are being lost along the way but there are some people who are still doing it and we want to actually kind of provide them uh, alternative source of livelihood so we would want on a longer uh, walk or so like as I told you the full day walk we would like to end right. it at their house when they can perform something, uh, some kind of hymn mm. or musical performance for the guest. Yeah, interesting. And uh, yeah, you speak about an interesting situation as well, right? Uh, because of um, the lack of, uh, let's say, patrons for like these art forms, they're slowly dying out. No, actually, I would like to just, uh, interrupt you. There. It, it's mm -hmm. not like a lack of patrons because what is interesting mm -hmm. is that these families are supported by the temple. So mm -hmm. when I told you about the Amubasi Mela, so mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. prasad, you know, the offerings. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, even Ambani has donated a huge amount of gold to the temple. The Ekta Kapoor, mm -hmm. I believe, comes to the temple. All these big celebrities come, right? But uh, mm -hmm. the prasad, the first prasad, these are the people, uh, like this community, uh, they mm -hmm. are the ones who only get this prasad. And Mm -hmm. Every day, the bhog, right, khichri or some food that is made yep. in the temple, it, all these families are getting it, uh, they are given that bhog from the temple. So even if they don't uh, buy any rations or something, they get a three meal at home without any expense. So it is not mm. that they have to go out looking for a job, but as I said, even the guy and buy and all the ones who uh, cut hair or do sacrifices, they have to take bhiksha. 
so diksha is a it's this discipline that you have to follow which is very difficult mm. for a lot of people and now with mm. easier way out you know like in go just go and you get a salary and this and that right it's a easier way out. so it is not that they have to go out looking for money or something it is that mm-hmm. they have a easier way of living yeah it may not be as black and white as we think there's a lot more demands and thank you for uh <coughs> kind of explaining that to us as well um uh, just talking while we are uh, discussing about the communities and the people right uh, one other thing that uh, often gets overlooked when we are talking about history of uh, places within the subcontinent within India or the region that was considered as India from back in the day is the ahoms right uh, ahoms have been a very critical or a crucial part to assam or this region right and uh, one of the kingdoms that actually ended up ruling for a period of over 600 years and they <coughs> even don't get a lot of mention right uh, if you're talking mainstream be it media or being a uh, academy or uh, cu- curriculums uh, school curriculums whatever it is we often uh, miss that bit as well do you want to touch upon at, at least a high level about the ahoms and their contributions to the region presently yeah sure so the ahoms uh, uh, it is believed that they actually migrated from thailand and mm. their ancient capital was a place called sipsagar so mm-hmm. that is where you still have some of the monuments still standing but a lot of them have actually kind of uh, gone you know not well maintained but now the uh, archaeological asi archaeological survey of india is taken quite a lot of steps and uh, mm-hmm. the birth uh, birth anniversary of uh, lachit borpukan was uh, amazing general has mm-hmm. been celebrated in a very big way so uh, one of the interesting things is that in the national defense academy in pune uh, there are mm-hmm. only two statues of uh, indian generals one is shivaji maharaj and the second is lachit borpukan and yeah he was uh, another thing people when they talk about mughal invasions and uh mogul war like fighting the moguls they only think of elephants horses and camels and foot soldiers but yep. what happened in assam was that uh, lachit borpukan was able to defeat a huge uh, mogul navy so this was a naval battle yep. that took place in assam and it was not once they had uh, i won't exactly give the number but uh, he actually defeated them a couple of times and assam was not conquered by the moguls later on the british came in and uh, there was some kind of a treaty and we did have tea plantations and coal mining and all of that happening but assam was not conquered by any islamic invaders or so yeah <laughs> it's it's kind of my fault but the names of uh, all these temples like the kamakha temple that you see today are mm. have been built by ahom kings mm. but i can i get their names mixed up so i will not actually tell her uh, mention their names uh, yeah no that's fine but uh, i think it uh, we kind of touch upon right uh, even in mainstream we barely discuss this enough or it's spoken about it's not spoken about yeah enough, it's right? a beautiful bollywood plot someone should make a movie about it like seriously no yeah seriously uh, especially the contributions they've uh, made to the region and uh, like you mentioned uh, ruling for over 600 years and uh, imagine like the moguls had pretty much taken over uh, uh, all places around right like for example they were almost, they were there in bengal for the longest time Assam was a huge state, so Nagaland, Meghalaya, parts of Arunachal, they were all part of Assam. Early on, the capital of Assam was actually in Shillong. So uh, it was a huge territory and had a lot of natural resources. There were they were stories uh, that you go to one of the rivers and you just put your, you know, uh, put a net there and you'll get gold. That is how the rich mm. the state was. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the mighty Mughals, as we have been hearing, even they were not uh, able to conquer this place. So it kind of speaks to the um, the bravery and the courage and the rule of the Ahoms, right? So definitely needs to be speak, uh, spoken about more. And uh, to your point, the NDA has been actually also giving out the Lachad Borpukan gold medal for the best cadet, right? So they've okay. been doing this for a little while as well. So... uh that kind of speaks to it uh, to his contributions to and um, we recently celebrated the 400th year um, anniversary so a lot of important things that 
we don't come across enough or give enough importance. And uh, thank you for uh, you and for Kama Kya Vox uh, actually making uh, these at least a little bit more mainstream to the layperson, right? Um, we actually did a pretty well-rounded and detailed coverage of the uh, Kama Kya Temple Complex, its importance, uh, the different beliefs and uh, t- uh, the ties to Tantric worship and a little uh, shed some light on that too and uh, covered a lot of uh, important things. What are some of the other kinds of walks, uh, let's say in and around Guwahati, that you uh, take your uh, audience or your walkers around Prasenjit? So let's say when the, the old Guwahati has expanded in a very big way, but uh, mm-hmm. let's say if you call it old Guwahati, is a place called Uzan Bazar. So there are some mm. very beautiful uh, Assam type houses. So when you hear the word Banglo, right? So it's Bangla style of architecture. That's how the word has come about. So similarly, there's a very beautiful uh, traditional houses here. And a lot of prominent uh, people have lived in these places. So there, there's a university, uh, which, as I was talking, which has done research on Kamekha. So a lot of important people have passed out and this is all along the Brahmaputra. So in the morning, when you go for a walk, you actually get to see beautiful flower markets, old buildings, some important temples. And now they have actually built a cable car. So this is one of the few mm. cable cars that actually goes ac- uh, on a, across a river. So normally when you go on a cable car, it's on a mountain or something. Right. So you know, we, can, uh, we basically do a walk along the riverside, show some of the old buildings like the uh, right now, the present high court judge lives in a particular building. You cannot enter it, but it's a stunning mm-hmm. building. And then we go for a walk in Uzan Bazar. So there's a temple called Ugratara Temple, again, a very old place. We saw some of the old houses in that area. That is what one of the other walks we're doing. And we are also focusing on doing like one and two, uh, one and two day sightseeing tours in and around Guwahati. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a national park which is called Pobitora, which is about one, one and a half hours from here. And it has got the highest mm-hmm. density of one horn rhinos. Close mm-hmm. to Pobitora, we have a, play, a village called Mayang. So Mayang is known as the black magic capital of the world. Oh, there are okay. some people who are developing some kind of a tourist a walk around the village. And they, talk, they have mm-hmm. actually made a museum of, like a, of artifacts that were used and so on. Mm-hmm. And then there are places like... Uh, Bhima Shankar, which is a Jyotirlinga. We have a Umananda Island, which is the smallest uh, inhabited island in the world. So we in mm. Assam, we have the largest inhabited island and the smallest inhabited island. <laughs> right, right. The largest one being Majli, which yeah. we did an episode on as well, and I'll be happy to link that in the show notes. But yeah, quite the, quite the diversity and the difference also there right between the largest and the smallest river you can actually area. spend good two days here you know just mm. exploring different sites the government yeah. right now is you know making huge efforts to promote tourism in the city so just yeah. about two days back they've announced that for the next three months till the uh, monsoons they're going to have mm. a tourism festival happening on the banks sandbanks of the river so they're going to have mm. like who dance and so on going on every day. So this is like activities for guests to come and experience. They're making a beautiful uh, like a corridor along the river. So they have already mm-hmm. made this uh, Brahmaputra Heritage Center. Uh, it's like a museum overlooking the Brahmaputra. Got a good space for kids and so on. And has nice artifacts documenting the history of the city uh, of Assam. Yeah, no, definitely. There's a lot, right? I mean, from uh, even beyond those one to two day walks that uh, one to two day tours that you mentioned, if somebody is willing to stay, uh, take it slow and explore uh, the the state and the surrounding areas, has a lot to offer, right? Just beyond being a, yeah. uh, like a transit point for other um, states in the northeast, right? Right from uh, I read about these very famous gurudwara in Dubri to yes. a popular uh, mosque. Uh, right in, in Hajo, region, uh, yeah. in Hajo, yeah. uh, this uh, popular Buddhist sites too. Yeah, so Hajo is a center for Hindu, Buddhist, and uh, Islam. So in Hajo, they have a, a Muslims go to this place called Pua Mecca. So Pua yeah. in Asmis means one fourth. So when you go and visit Pua Mecca, you get one fourth of the blessings of going to Mecca. 
Yeah, so a lot of things, things really uh, unknown to many, right? <laughs> so it's great to actually even understand and learn that there's uh, so much more that one can do even within the country, right? Without having to leave uh, the country. Uh, and even beyond these, right? Beyond religious places, national parks like Kaziranga and Manas, right? That's another angle to tourism, right? For those who, exactly, are, who yeah. are interested in nature, there's that. Uh, there's bird watching tours. I think even you do around the Nilachal Hills. Um, that can Nilachal Hill that can be done. We are developing an arts and craft tour, uh, maybe for the coming season, not not this year, but uh, mm. next year we'll be doing an arts and craft tour. So there's a lot of uh, yeah. bell metal work. Uh, there's uh, cane and bamboo work. There's traditional jewelry. So we want to basically take people to show these things. So I had a request for like a textile tour. So we are combining yeah. textiles, arts and craft. The silks of Assam are also very, very uh, famous and popular, right? Do you want to just give the listeners uh, an overview of, let's say, the gumcho, I think, right? They, they call you... The, yeah, we just got the GI tag for the gamosa. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Every household, if you go to... Not in the city, but you go to any rural countryside. Uh, generally, the women do not buy clothes. So everything they are wearing, mm. uh, they'll have a, a loom in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And everything mm -hmm. that they use, what they wear, is made by them. Assam, uh, about an hour, hour and a half from Guwahati, is a place called Hualkusi, which is known as Manchester of the East. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the most famous silk is called Muga silk. So Muga is right. a very strong, naturally golden fiber. Uh, and then the other ones are Path, Airy. So we have, I think, four types of uh, uh, silk, out of which Muga is very well known. But my favorite is Airy because it's something like Pashmina. So you can actually uh, carry it in the winters and it keeps you warm. You can also have it in summers, it kind of keeps you, it protects you from the sun. So it is known for its uh, UV protection qualities. That was also like uh, one of a kind that I came across, right? And yeah. Talking about silk and UV protection, uh, that's that's kind of neat. So, um, yeah, they're very, very important or have been very important and well known from back in the day as well. And uh, the, uh, I don't know, the traditional wear, uh, Mekela Chador, yes, I think, the saris, right? Yeah, yeah the, the, the those and the gumchas like we uh, mentioned earlier. It's like a three-piece uh, three piece suit that the men yeah. wear. That's something similar for what women. Yeah. So there's Riha, Mekla and Chadar. I think. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, a lot of uh, important things and a few other things like bell metal works and stuff uh, for handicrafts you mentioned. Uh, I think those are also important and for those interested, uh, you can definitely cover those off. Um, and how can we forget about the food of the region? Um, Prasenjit, can you uh, do? You, do you want to give a quick overview of if uh, one is visiting Assam or Guwahati, what should be uh, maybe a couple of things you should definitely try out and uh, that are popular in the region? Uh, we don't eat very. Uh, we do have the hottest chili in the world, which is the Bhujjolokya, mm -hmm. but generally yeah, ghost peppers. Yeah, ghost peppers. But uh, generally, our food is very simple. It's like boiled, steamed, not many masalas, uh, not many spices. Uh, the uh, well-known, like more popular dishes in Assam is something called as tenga. So it's a mm. sour curry. You can have it with fish. Uh, it's a fish preparation. You can have like, we call them boar. It's like uh, mm. lentil balls, you know, which is put in this curry. Mm. We are a rice and fish eating community, mostly. Uh -huh. And we do have a lot of different tribes in the state. You do find a lot of uh, vegetarian food available, but we love our non-veg. So, mm -hmm. you know, we eat like dark pigeons and uh, pork is also very good. One of my favorite dishes is bamboo shoot and pork. And then mm -hmm. we have traditional barbecues, which is called korika. You just put meat on a stick and put it next to a fire. <laughs> and then desserts are, desserts are some simple, like mostly like here. And our breakfast... Mm -hmm. Uh, consists of things like uh, curd, the traditional ones, curd, uh, mm -hmm. flattened rice, uh, mori, which is puffed up rice. Uh, and then we have this uh, borasal, which is like uh, sticky rice. And we have liquid guru. So those are the traditional breakfasts. 
some people mm-hmm. still do eat them on a daily basis but we generally have it uh during bihu mm-hmm. so bihu breakfast is like all these traditional foods together yeah yeah definitely uh, i mean a lot of uh, important ones you called out there but if you want to make it a little more exotic i also came across things like uh, silkworm fry right yes, if you want to yeah. mix it up a little bit uh, that's one thing but um, as you mentioned as well the uh, bamboo shoots and rice and pork those are uh, the i think very uh, well known ones along with bhut jalokia uh, the ghost peppers are one of the hottest peppers uh, that are found uh, just in the also a uh, lime you know the lemon that uh, mm. we produce here is uh, very different so the flavor mm. is very unique uh, very refreshing so you just have like dal chawal chilies and uh, nimbu and that's good enough <laughs> okay yeah a lot of lot of interesting things and uh, dal ongla or uh, chicken and rice powder i believe that's also something that's um, popular in the region uh, yeah if you're a foodie there's definitely a lot of lot of things for you some of them known and some of them uh, very new and exotic that you may want to try out when you're here and uh, red ant eggs amroli porur top <laughs> It's not the things I just came across when I was doing my research, so I just go don't go by my research and uh, look it up for yourself. But um, the, the the bottom line being that there's a lot of very very interesting things uh, from a gastronomic perspective too that one can explore and discover during your visit and stay in uh, Guwahati and in Assam. Uh, lastly, just closing this off with the very very popular celebration of Bihu, which you made a quick mention of. Prasanjit, do you want to give uh, listeners a quick overview of about this very very popular festival that's often synonymous with Assam? Yeah, so Bihu is the celeb- it's the celebration of the different cycles of the f- uh, of agriculture or of farming mm-hmm. our new year is uh, is uh, in april which we call bohag bihu so bohag bihu is basically if you put go- uh, bihu on google you'll see girls and boys dancing right that is generally in april uh, which is like a celebration of dance music food and but the mm-hmm. one that is coming up is mag bihu so mag bihu revolves mostly around food uh, this is the mm-hmm. end of the harvesting season <clears throat> so in from january to april it is like all the harvesting is done they have sorted out the uh, grains and then they take a break for those three four months january ends the cycle of this thing and april starts it so bohag mm-hmm. is for dance and uh, celebration <laughs> the january mag bihu is for food and then we also have another bihu which is called as kati bihu and mm-hmm. this is uh celebrated in a very small way where you light these uh, earthen lamps it is believed that this is a time where you have a lot of insects in the field so the insects are attracted mm. to the fire and it's kind of a pest control that happens so okay. these festivals uh, also co- uh, coincide with onam and pongal and other celebration makar sankranti you know sure. so there are common festivals around india yeah uh, definitely try to that and also the importance of rice and farming in the region right there yes. and I highlight that too but yeah thank you so much for giving us such a lovely lovely uh, encapsulation of guwahati and assam and uh, even things beyond that uh, right from the spiritual aspects of it through the kamakya walks that you offer to the more cultural aspects of it that we discussed during the latter half of the episode and uh, like we mentioned right at the beginning more attention and uh, eyeballs more footfalls whatever it takes it deserves all of these things right it's uh, such an important part of um, india that hasn't gotten enough uh, attention a very very unexplored and undiscovered gem and uh, i think your uh, tagline for i believe for kamakya walks encapsulates it right the more you explore the more you discover um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much prasanjit for uh, giving us such a lovely summary of uh, literally the gateway to the northeast for uh, listeners who are interested in taking up walks with you what is the best way of uh, learning more about them and getting in touch with you uh facebook page is pretty good uh, my weak point is uh, social media so i am actually asking someone to handle my social media but we have a instagram page and we have facebook i'm sure you can share the link i can share it with you yep just drop me a message whenever you want to go for a walk we'll be more than happy to take you around and show you the city and tell you about the northeast
Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, for those interested even beyond Kamakya and uh, Assam, there's a variety of other tours uh, in the Northeast region that Prasunji does through his uh, other venture, the Six Degree Adventures. Um, definitely do check those out as well. All of these links will be included in the show notes. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having Prasunji back on the podcast maybe sometime in the future to discuss more about his uh, other works in Northeast, uh, other trips and tours in Northeast that he does. Uh, but it has been such a lovely experience talking to you and learning more about Assam and Gauhati. Thanks so much, Prasenjit. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure talking to you. That was yet another great episode on the Musafir Stories. Make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. We are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir Stories. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. Music